Uh, this is about the anti-democratic aspects of the, de of the Democratic Party. Uh, and what I will be doing is talking about the things that we would like to see changed. So just to backtrack a little bit, uh, the United States was the first country to be founded on the concept of the rule of law. And we believe that, uh, that the democracy must be restored uh, um, to the rules governing the Democratic Party. The Unity Commission of 2016 uh, sponsored and passed resolutions, but those changes were temporary. And what we are uh, proposing is that we organize and elect officers and delegates to the Democratic National Committee who can make permanent corrections to the rules of the Democratic Party. <clears throat> so the information that we're covering in this segment is first we'll review what is a democracy because there seems to be confusion about what that concept means. Um, we're gonna talk about what the Democratic Party Charter and bylaws say about democratic participation. And I think you will find this inspiring. Um, we will talk about the three types of changes that are needed to make the Democratic Party more democratic. And then I have examples of what needs to be fixed. And then we will finish with a call to action. So just to review, uh, a democracy means government by the people. And especially, and this is Miriam Webster saying this, uh, especially the rule by the majority. Uh, and the second definition is that it is a government in which the supreme power is vested in the people and is exercised by them directly or indirectly through a system of representation, usually involving periodically held free elections. Uh, in smaller groups, you know, you have direct democracy um, in larger organizations, such as the United States or in states, you need some form of representation so you have a group of people who can meet and, and, and make decisions on your behalf. Um, and then the definition of a representative is one that represents a constituency as a member in a legislative body. And for representatives to represent a majority the constituencies of each representative must be roughly equal in size. So a good example of this is the Congressional House of Representatives, which is, you know, every 10 years we take a census and we redraw uh, congressional boundaries and it roughly makes all of the congressional districts uh, equal in size. And that's why uh, when states shrink, shrink in size in population, their number of um, uh, congressional districts go down, and states whose population increases, their congressional districts go up. Uh, not so good example is the Congress is the Congressional Senate, where every state has two senators, and so a state like California, which has what something like fifty three congressional districts, uh, has only two senators representing all of those people. The same as Rhode Island. Uh, South Dakota and North Dakota and Minnesota and uh, um, you know Wyoming, which are very low population states, so not so good uh, representation in the Senate. And again, the constituencies have to be equal. So uh, you know, a, a, if a representative has to represent as many people as another representative, uh, because if when you get an imbalance, that's when you start having people whose votes have more power than other people's votes. And, you know, this concept sounds really obvious, but then when you get into what we seem to be doing to democratic organizations where you have, uh, you have a base that's elected by some, some coalition, and then you have other people be, be given votes whose votes are equal to those representing the people, then that starts skewing the representation and ultimately that you end up with decisions that do not reflect the will of the majority. So now I'm going to read the uh, what the preamble of the DNC charter says. So the first of all, the charter is the governing document, and and uh, it and the bylaws themselves uh, fall beneath the charter, and the preamble is the aspirational uh, statement of what the party should be. And so it says, recognizing that the vitality of the nation's political institutions 
has been the foundation of its enduring strength. We acknowledge that a political party which wishes to lead must listen to those it would lead and which asks for the people's trust must prove that it trusts the people and a party in which hopes to call forth the best the nation can achieve must embody the best of the nation's heritage and traditions. So again, must listen to those that would lead and trust the people is built into the preamble of the Democratic Party. And then what you find in, the, in Article 1, Section 4, some very interesting language. Uh, just, um, it, uh, it says that the party shall establish standards and rules that, to afford all members of the Democratic Party full, timely, and equal opportunities to participate in decisions concerning the selection of candidates, the formulation of policy, and the conduct of all of other party affairs. And then it goes through a, uh, uh, without prejudice, uh, on the basis of sex, race, age, color, creed, national origin, religion, economic status, sexual orientation, gender identity, ethnic identity or disability, and further to promote fair campaign practices and the fair education of disputes. So very clear uh, what it says in the charter, again, that takes a precedence over what has been done within the bylaws. So there are three things that make the Democratic Party not democratic. Uh, first of all, the bylaws and rules have strayed from the vision and the preamble, uh, and we'll give examples of those uh, later in the presentation. The rules have been weaponized uh, to marginalize democratic participation. And as we talk to more people uh, from the different states across the, the entire nation, we're finding uh, so a lot of consistency in which the rules have been weaponized. And we've mentioned some of those earlier today where the mute button in Zoom meetings has been used egregiously. Uh, you know, a, a fundamental principle of, of democratic meetings is that you have bi-directional oral communication so that you have the right, you can assert your right to make a interrupting motion, which you cannot do if someone is illegally muting you from speaking. And then finally, we have the rules not being followed. And of course, this uh, surfaced uh, most prominently in 2016, when uh, you know the, they released all of the communications from the DNC, showing that there was a consistent breaking of the rules in the way the, the candidates were treated that year for president. So the three things that we need to do to restore democracy to the Democratic Party is number one, align the bylaws to the vision of the preamble. And this means amending the bylaws of the party to do this. Um, number two, we need to end the practice of weaponizing the rules. And we have a proposal for doing that. And then we need to follow the rules. And really that means it puts uh, the onus on the members of the Democratic Party to, uh, to uh, basically be a pain and point out when the rules are being broken and when the leadership has to stop uh, when they're breaking them and when they have to stop. And, you know, and there are many cases where they don't even realize that they're breaking the rules because they've just done what their predecessors have told them to do. And so they think that what they're doing is appropriate. But, you know, Robert's rules uh, is has a bad name because they these rules have been demonized and weaponized uh, but really what Robert's Rules of Order are the, the tools by which you can assert uh, your rights in a democracy. So the following are examples of rules changes. Um, uh, and you know, was the, was the first major action that we did inside People for Democratic Party Reform was that we proposed uh, changes that we submitted to the Rules and Bylaws Committee in the 2020 convention, hoping that, you know, if uh, I, I knew that there was no chance any of them would be passed, but at least we were hoping that they would be discussed within the Rules Committee so people would start being aware of the things that need to be changed. And as far as I know, they were, did not even be, uh, they didn't even merit a discussion. They were ignored completely. 
So the, to me, the, the most uh, visible example of why the system is broken was what uh, Judah had talked about earlier, which was when in the 2020 Democratic National Convention, um, Medicare for All was blocked from the platform of the Democratic Party, even though it had support of approximately 82% of all Democrats, if not more. And so how did this happen? This happened because the convention rules allowed the presidential candidates to select the convention standing rules members. And if you think about it, how did we ever get to a process where the presidential candidate selects the members of the committee and not the people? And so, you know, what happened was that uh, the, the, the President Biden had a majority on the uh, platform and resolutions committee, and they were able to block because they had a larger number of votes, um, the getting the Medicare for all into the platform. If the members of that committee had been elected by the people, then the, it, it would have easily uh, passed and been added to the platform. And so the way to correct this is to correct the convention rules. So the delegates are elected by Democrats, not by the candidates. Another thing that surfaced uh, first, uh, most prominently in the 2016 convention and a little bit in the 2020, although by then uh, pretty much it had been decided who the candidates were, was that unelected delegates to the Democratic National Convention had a vote in the selection of presidential candidates. So if you remember the slide about equal representation, so uh, all of us in the states went through a process of electing delegates to go to the convention, but it turns out that there are all these other people who are also granted delegate status who could vote, even though they didn't represent anyone specifically. So all of the Democrats in the country was represented by that body that was elected, but then there was this group of other people who could also vote. And, you know, pr presumably their, uh, their, their votes didn't affect the outcome in 2016. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's just inherently unfair, which everyone can sense. So uh, the reason why they could do that is that the bylaws <clears throat> give voting rights <clears throat> to many convention delegates beyond those elected by the states. So to fix this, we, uh, we need to change the DNC bylaws so that delegates uh, who are elected are the ones that uh, vote at the convention. And it is perfectly fine for all of the other uh, uh, unelected delegates to be there. They would just be non-voting delegates. Um, and certainly, you know, I think it would be great if they would speak in debate. Another one is the composition of the DNC standing committees. So what currently happens is that the DNC chair appoints all members of the standing committees in violation of both the preamble and Article 1, Section 4. Um, and, and so how did this happen? Well, apparently at some point in time, the DNC members approved these changes to the bylaws. And so the fix is to change the bylaws so they align with the vision set forth in the preamble. And, you know, there's a number of ways in which they can do this, but really there needs to be both uh, geographic distribution of the members of the committee and uh, and they need to be elected. They don't need, we, we, it is unhealthy when the members of these committee committees owe their position on that committee to the chair because they feel like they then uh, are accountable to the chair, even though in theory they are accountable to the people. Uh, if you've attended these meetings and heard the discussion, you can tell exactly what's going on. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of good people on those committees that tends to be East Coast centric. So those of us on the West Coast uh, are underrepresented. And uh, there's not a lot, you know, certainly on the rules and bylaws committee, there's not uh, the kind of understanding of democracy, which I would like to see. And so uh, to fix this problem, we need to make the, uh, the members of the standing committees, if they have these powers uh, to make decisions, uh, they need to represent the people. There needs to be a process for addressing the anti-democratic state parties. Uh, the DNC standing committees fail to regulate state party organizations. We know that because one of our members just filed a challenge 
with the DNC uh, because the, the, the party leaders in the state had ignored the mandate to have an affirmative action plan for 42 years. And they also ignored both their own bylaws and the rules of the DNC about publicizing elections so that the, uh, the elections of officers of that state's central committee was pretty much um, uh, an inside job. And it certainly didn't reflect any, any kind of diversity. Um, uh, the, the, this was turned into the credentials committee and their comment was, well, we don't want to get involved in this because all the states would be coming to us with their problems. And yes, if all of the states are doing these kinds of violations, all 50 states then should be turned in and the committee should be doing their job of holding the, the county parties accountable. Uh, and if, if the, the, the parties continue to do anti-democratic uh, activities, then they need to um, either elect new leadership or uh, in the case of what happened with this, this state, there was an agreement that they would amend the bylaws and, and uh, write the affirmative action plan and set up an affirmative action, action committee and, and really make some corrections within that state. So, uh, you know, what we need and what we did was, this was one of the proposals that we had sent to the convention last year, was that there would be a way for an easy way for people to uh, bring up the anti-democratic practices that they are finding in their state and have the state, the, the, the national party organization step in and clean this up. Because until the party structures in the states are run fairly and openly, there, there will always be people exiting the party and it just makes the party weak. So what do we need to do? Uh, these are the changes uh, that cannot be adopted unless there is a pro-democracy majority of delegates in the Democratic National Committee who can make these changes. Uh, the other way these changes can be made as at the convention. So it is, uh, it is, it was a possibility that the changes that we had submitted last year to the Rules and Bylaws Committee could have been approved by the Rules and Bylaws Committee and sent to the convention floor and adopted on the floor. Um, that would have been uh, a miracle, but it is, uh, it is what you can do inside a convention, which is the highest, uh, highest level meeting of the party uh, in every four-year cycle. So what we will be talking about in, uh, in the strategy sessions tomorrow is how we will go about um, uh, electing uh, those people to the, the party so that we, we can do to the, at the national level what happened in Nevada, which is returning the party to the people. So having said all that, is there any questions? And again, if you don't know how to raise your hand, they're down under uh, the reactions. Or if anyone has any comments, uh, they're more than welcome to speak up. Are there any comments in the chat? Mm -hmm. um, someone wanted to know if the slides could be made available. Uh, yes. So the we'll post <clears throat> the slides on the PDPR uh, website. And then, of course, the um, the, uh, the the videos of these sessions will be posted as well. Um, Christine, um, I was wondering if you in like in new business in a meeting when you do a resolution or something. And if it gets voted down right away because you don't have the majority, can you always bring it up again at a later time just so that it's on record that this is being wanting to be talked about? Yes, there's some rules around that, but you can always reconsider a decision made by the body. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there's uh, something like 57 incidental motions of which none get, most of them never get used which are your tools in your democratic toolkit. 
Uh, and so if you join PDPR, then you will have visibility into uh, work groups where we talk about, you know, we have one group that, that meets monthly and talks about different aspects of uh, your rights in, a, in an organization. We have another group that's led by Jeff Weston, which people can bring in their specific problems. Um, that, that arose out of a, uh, a, a, a monthly dinner that we used to have here in, in my state where we would bring our problems to the professional registered parliamentarians and then they would uh, walk us through how the, the rules of democracy could be applied to our situation and then how what we would do to remedy it. And that was really helpful for me and my understanding of uh, how all of this works. And so we have replicated that with inside PDPR, where we have a forum for you to bring instances of what happens to you in your part, in your, in your local state. Um, and then we can talk about uh, why it's wrong and then how to push back against it. Uh, Raymond, go ahead. Hi, thanks, Larry. Uh, yeah, we have a question in the chat. Um, John asks, do local committees have to allow their meetings to be public? Uh, I believe the answer is yes, and that's because the DNC, which has the, uh, the rules that govern the entire parties, um, uh, mandates that, that the meetings are open. Um, you know, similarly, uh, the state, the, the national party uh, requires signed ballots for votes of officers, which uh, some people have a problem <laughs> with. Um, but yeah, those are the, it, uh, anything that's in the, uh, the, the, the charter and the bylaws of the Democratic National Committee have to be followed by all the state parties. And there's some very interesting stuff in there. And that's what uh, Selena Vickers used to file her complaints. Um, John, go ahead. Okay, yeah, no, thank you for answering the question. I, I just want to follow up because, um, yeah, I, I, I asked that question because uh, Selena, I heard Selena say that, um, that our local parties have to allow broadcasting uh, basically, what in our in our uh, committee meetings, what they say is, um, you know, the the members of the committee do not uh, give permission to be uh, to be uh, recorded or or broadcast. Um, and it, it just it, I, I read the DNC charter, uh, the DNC bylaws, and I wasn't completely sure if that that applied to our our local party too. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess I guess that's the main question because you know we have. We have some activists here that want to um, kind of see what's going on at, at the committee meetings, and uh, and they're they're just they're not allowing people to um, to join the committee meeting. Actually, they they disallow reporters to join the committee meeting. Yeah, there's there's a number of things in there that uh, to be gone through. So you you should be able to attend them. So broadcasting a meeting is a is a different thing, but you know people cannot. Uh, cannot uh, make up these rules uh, unless you, your bylaws have given them the power to do that. So the, you know, the basic rule is, you know, the, your body, which is your state central committee or whatever the, the membership organization is, that is, that is the organization where, where all power originates. And so, you know, we, we saw uh, in many states abuse of the, the mute button and unless that was agreed to by the by the members of the party, then that is an illegal imposition upon the meeting. And actually, you can, uh, if if that was not agreed to, anything that is considered in a meeting like that uh, is a is a violation of basic parliamentary rules, and it's called a continuing breach. And you can question the validity of any decisions that have been made. And so, you know, one of the things one of the principles of democracy is that you bring up an issue and you debate the pros and cons and with data, you make an informed vote. And so anything that works against that uh, is really not a healthy. So yes, yeah, so those kinds of things uh, are, are what we discuss inside our work groups and you're more than welcome to bring those in and discuss them. We're finding a lot of, you know, there's a, 
a common pattern, which leads me to believe that there's a class given somewhere on how to how to <laughs> webinize rules that uh, because the the it's it's just the same thing repeated in state after state. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm from New Jersey, but uh, thank you, Lawrence. New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> I actually love New Jersey. Um, Mary, go ahead. Someone asked the question, and I was thinking it, um, so I decided to raise my hand. Do you know if any of these conversations are going on in the, the Republican Party? Like, are there progressives or are there people talking about the rules in the Re Republican Party? Well, I'm not a good one to ask because I am certainly encamped in my echo chamber. And uh, the last thing I, <laughs> I want to do is monitor them. You know, I really hope that there are people who have stayed with the Republican Party and is trying to fight back. But all of the Republicans I personally know has either stopped participating in the party or has left the Republican Party. And so what you have remaining is the extreme group who really doesn't even believe in democracy. So uh, I don't know if there's anyone trying to, to do that. I would be happy to mentor them as a parliamentarian uh, if there was a group that wanted to, you know, basically do what we're doing for the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, but uh, no one's approached. Well, um, I'm one of the co-chairs of the West Virginia Affirmative Action Committee that you were just talking about. But what I got out of what you said is that there's a whole body of people out there who are as disenfranchised with that party as we have been with ours. So I'm not quite sure how to access those people, but um, that's what I heard in your answer. Thanks, Larry. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, uh, Tammy, go ahead. Um, I raised my hand for Lauren, but it looks like she was able to oh. raise her hand. <laughs> Um, but there was a comment in the chat um, that says, on our central committee, there's a dino state rep running our county committee that's part of his district, but he does not live here. So he also runs the committee in the next county over, also his district he does live in. I find this to be very obstructing what can be done. Well, uh, you start with the with the the bylaws and there might be state bylaws that that uh, uh, that come into play here uh, there there should be a residency requirement uh, so you don't have carpet baggers running something that they don't um, uh, but you you have to have a a, a rule against it um, so if they're a democrat within your state it might be a little it might be a tough argument you know, the, the biggest problem we have is we elect uh, inappropriate people to to run our organizations uh, who don't respect people's rights. Um, so again, uh, you know, maybe, you know, either attend uh, the session I, I I'm i gonna go through next um, on how to read bylaws and find stuff in them or join PDPR and, and uh, uh, we can discuss it there. We also, uh, on a monthly basis, dissect a state's bylaws. So we've done Massachusetts, and we've done Oregon, and we've done Florida, um, and we'll be doing the next state uh, probably this Thursday, this coming Thursday. Uh, Lauren, go ahead. Yes, I am on the Rhode Island Democratic State Committee. And supposedly people may think that Rhode Island is like the bluest of the blue states. It's actually the Dino of the dino state. state. <laughs> um, uh, it is incredibly undemocratic. It is basically filled with General Assembly members. There is no separation between General Assembly, which is all Dems, and the Democratic State Committee. Um, in 2020, a bunch of us wanted to be on the bylaws committee because they were redoing the bylaws, a bunch of us being progressives. The chair chooses who's on the bylaws committee. It's not done randomly. Names aren't picked out of the hat. It's chosen. And wouldn't you know it, not a single Bernie crack 
was put on the bylaws committee. I requested to at least be able to go to attend the bylaws committee, and I was refused, saying that those are private meetings and that I won't ha- and that I can't have any access to them. This I'm finding this was extremely undemocratic. And of course, the bylaws get changed and get passed, and they are worse than we- what they were before. And significant changes couldn't be made, like getting people on the committees fairly, like not having such heavy presence of the General Assembly on each of the committees. They're already on the General Assembly, right? And so I'm try- I would love to utilize some of this information and put a formal complaint, even though it was 2020, and I'm not sure if I can still do this, or 2018, uh, put in a formal complaint that the bylaws should be null and voided because of how undemocratic they were when they were established and voted on in the first place. The other thing is myself and another woman was at this open meeting, well, not this meeting for um, state committee members, we were actually pretty much holding our hands up, requesting to be heard, and we were 100% ignored, but those white males, man, they were called on. So it, it was, it was a horror show. We actually wrote about it. I wrote about it. And um, yeah, so that's what I'm dealing with in uh, the state of Rhode Island, which is incredibly undemocratic. I think we need to go through the bylaws of Rhode Island. Oh, that would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, um, the number of things you mentioned there. Uh, if, As I said, there is the concept of a continuing breach. And Robert's Rules of Order gives five uh, conditions that constitute a continuing breach. And if something was done in gross violation of parliamentary law, uh, then that is a that is one of the instances of continuing breach, and you can you can uh, you can contest the validity of any decision they made, including elections. Uh, you know the problem is is that we don't have anyone to go to uh, because the Supreme Court has ruled that the the parties are private institutions, and so you know what we have to do then is basically police ourselves. We can't go to the Secretary of State. We can't go to the police. We can't go to anyone to find support for enforcing the rules. And so, you know, the the, the framers of the Constitution were all gentlemen, and, and I think they had this vision that everyone would behave like them and follow the rules going forth. And, uh, you know, we we're finding that in 2021, that is not the case. So, uh, you know, this is how I, you know, my approach then is to uh, treat this as an activist and use the other tools uh, that minorities can invoke, such as publicity and trying to shame these people. Uh, but it's, it's pretty amazing because there are literally hours, hundreds of hours of meetings out there of live streamed meetings where they just do the most egregious violations of people's rights and they don't even care. Uh, it's out there for the record for everyone to see, but because so many of the people in our population pays no attention to it, they get away with it. Exactly. Exactly what happened. So, yeah, we'd love to bring your problems in and, and go through them. So by all means, do. I can um, send you over a copy of the Rhode Island bylaws, uh, Democratic State Committee bylaws, which I have gone through numerous times. So <laughs> I know that <laughs> they were going against it. But yeah, the course of action was just like tough. That was basically what I was told. <laughs> you know, the other thing that goes on is uh, is that the bylaws get changed. And I, I have sat on the Central Committee in my state since... Uh, well, I started in in uh, 1998, and there was just a couple of years where I was not attending them. But I, but since 2005, uh, I was I've attended every meeting with the exception of one, and that was because they moved the meeting on top of a a uh, a vacation that I had already planned, and. Uh, I was recently cleaning out stuff and I found a copy of the bylaws in 2005 
and I started comparing them against what we currently have. And I swear, I do not remember most of those changes being proposed before the committee. And unfortunately, we had a secretary who didn't believe in recording <laughs> the motions of the, the bylaws changes. So we didn't even have the wording that was approved by the assembly when these bylaws changes were made. And so I cannot even go back through the minutes of the meeting since 2005 and reconstruct how those changes uh, came about because I can't even trust the minutes that were taken. Uh, and so, you know, there's all of these pieces that have to work together and be in place for a democracy to function. Uh, and unfortunately, we didn't have that. But one of the big ones was that there used to be a rule that 15 members of the state central committee could file a petition and call a state central committee meeting. That language somewhere along the line disappeared. So we uh, allegedly cannot do that. We have to do it by mail. It has uh, to be all written individually written in to the chair in order for a meeting to be called. We need 60 members. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any other questions? And certainly questions on, on uh, you know, the strategy going forward to affect these kinds of changes to the Democratic Party. I mean, this is really tragic because the United States is generally seen as the beacon of democracy for the rest of the world. And it's the, the, the country that gives other countries hope. And the Democratic Party is the most powerful political party in the world. And yet it, it does not behave in a way that exemplifies democracy. And so that is the gap we, we need to close. And it is my belief that if the Democratic Party would would embrace democracy, it would be twice as powerful than it, than it currently is. I think what its current behavior makes it weak. Um, Carolina. Hey, Carolina. Hi, Larry. Uh, I was wondering if you could reinforce a little bit on, on the requirements for meetings, because I see that a lot, that a meeting can, it's considered a meeting according to some of the branches of the party when when they call you for a webinar which i th i know that is not the case or if they remove the 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 permission for for using the chat or if they mute you you mentioned that right so so i was wondering if you can get into more details on that sure uh, if you if you read Robert's Rules of Order, and it, it's it's towards the beginning where the more important concepts are talked about, uh, it says that the definition of a meeting is when people gather in one room and have the ability to uh, to speak and hear what's going on. I mean, your four basic rights uh, in an organization is to attend meetings, to make motions, to speak and debate, and to vote. And no one can take those rights away from you, except if you pass special rules that take those away. And what happened during the pandemic, you know, I've kind of skewed it a little bit because we had state laws that said that, you know, we physically can't meet. And that was used as an excuse for taking away people's rights. But uh, in any event, there should have been rules written for the conduct of electronic meetings that was given to the membership to agree to. And so, you know, if you, if you're, if two thirds of your members gave up the right to uh, speak in di bi-directional oral communication, then, you know, they pretty much screw themselves. And with so many parties dominated by establishment people who will just do as they're told, this very much could have happened. Um, Robert says that these, that if you do not have bi-directional oral communication, then you do not have a, a democratic uh, assembly. And so uh, it is, you know, it is, it is some other kind of um, uh, entity. But again, you can question anything that is passed inside uh, something that is as egregious as that. The, the Florida Democratic Party met today uh, at a webinar forum. <laughs> yeah, and do you have to know how those rules were passed that they follow? 
<laughs> they were ignoring some of the questions, and you know, it's, I, I, I don't think that they follow any rules. I don't, I don't think that they know them very well. Yeah, quite possible. But you know, that's one of the things that we're trying to do with uh, people for democratic party reform is is make everyone aware of what their rights are in meetings so that they can demand them. You know, there, we find so many people. Uh, being caught flat-footed because uh, you know the, these people who hate democracy have the spiel down and they they assert their rights to uh, impose their will upon you so with with such conviction that we don't know how to fight back and you know there's many times where you know the words to fight back escape me because uh, I'm just flabbergasted by what they try to, to try to do but. If you join PDPR, then we can connect you with people to to help learn this stuff. Um, Joseph, go ahead. You need to unmute yourself, Joseph. Forgive me, I'm 78 years old. I'm uh, <laughs> not exactly computer savvy. I seem to recall uh, a, a, an issue that went as far as the United States Supreme Court a few years ago, where the progressive activists, the Bernie uh, supporters, uh, brought a case all the way to the Supreme Court. And the ruling of the Supreme Court, to my bet, re recollection, gave the exact ruling that the Democratic National Party is a private club, and as a private club, they can take actions that totally violate and go against their own bylaws whenever they choose to do so. So how, given the fact that we are up against this Supreme Court ruling, which I'm sure I have somewhere in my computer files, but at 78 years old, I'm not going to be able to find it while this session <laughs> is ongoing. And uh, how do we overcome the, um, uh, what's the word um, I'm looking for? The, um, the lack of standing to do anything to force a quote unquote private club to do anything. I need to read that language as well. Uh, I don't think it said that they could violate their own rules. I think yes. I, I vaguely remember it saying that they can do anything they want. So they can, they're welcome to change their rules. Uh, no, they can ignore their standing bylaws. That, that was it. I, I will try and find the file in my computer and send it to your organization at some future time, <laughs> but basically the Democratic Party is not an association or a Democrat, a small d Democratic institution. It's a private club. Yeah, I'd like to read that ruling. So that'd be great if you would send that to me. Okay. Is there any other questions today? Uh, Mary, go ahead. Hi, Larry. Um, somebody just said something about a forum or a meeting, and uh, that is one of my questions here. It's like, what do we call planning meetings where we come together with not everybody on the committee to, uh, you know, to discuss something? So I'd have to have more details about how All right. how this was created, but you know, ordinarily, if this is a committee that is created inside a a democratically run organization, then uh, you know the 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 rules around meeting notices and uh, uh, agendas and all that stuff apply, uh, unless there's been rules passed that skip them. Uh, so you know, you cannot have a committee with 15 members and then only let your friends know about the meeting so that they attend. I mean, that's just a, a gross violation of parliamentary law uh, because everyone's 
four basic rights are to attend meetings, to speak and debate, to vote, and to make motions. And, and so, and so how do how do you do how do you plan a meeting if you've got you know three or four people that are responsible for creating the agenda for planning the meeting and seeing what's going to be covered and not what what do you do with that well there there's some people who believe that they own the agenda but the agenda is really owned by the membership and that's why in a properly run meeting the first thing you do in the meeting uh, when the meeting convenes is you ask for the agenda to be approved and this is the opportunity for the membership to amend the agenda to change it to be something else so it's what a majority wants to do in that meeting that really uh, determines what the agenda is and if you don't like the agenda that's being proposed you can show up with a completely different agenda of your own, assuming you had a majority to get it passed. All right, I heard you say that the other night. That was new new information for me, but I, I that was really useful. <laughs> but but um, you know, if my co-chair and I are responsible for, we've got a. a, a an affirmative action committee meeting uh, on August 17th and we have a bunch of different things that we need to look to see how to include and what to you know what's the time frame of it and all that um, and I know that we're gonna in you know ask our secretary to be on the call with us so if you have if you have a conversation like that that's I mean, it's a planning meeting, and then I understand if I if we take the agenda to the meeting, and there are adjustments that want to be made, fine. But those we've been we've been accused of having backroom meetings. Um, and yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's, it's amazing what you can be accused of. Um, so. In, in, the, in the sense that a planning meeting is just a couple of people getting together to plan the agenda, that's perfectly okay. Um, you know, maybe it's, you know, there's one person who should be responsible for the agenda, or in your case, you have co-chairs, or however the bylaws uh, lay out the responsibility. If it doesn't give them to the, the co-chairs, then the agenda belongs, is configured by the secretary. Although, uh, I don't, know, I don't want to get too too far into the weeds, but you you're more than I mean this is America and we still have the right to assembly and you can get together and talk about what you need to do in a meeting uh, without being accused of backroom plotting. That is not backroom plotting. That is doing proper due diligence in writing the agenda for the meeting. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? We have a few more minutes. I know one's asking questions about the real problem, which is how do we organize in the in the in each of the states? And so we will be getting into that tomorrow. So I'm hoping everyone uh, hangs in there and joins us tomorrow uh, for the conclusion of this. Uh, we do have uh, Joseph. Uh, go ahead, Joseph. Joseph, you might be on mute. Please forgive me. Um, I just sent you the link to the Supreme Court case. It was when Debbie Wasserman Schultz admitted to the Supreme Court that the Democratic Party has every right to rig the primary campaign <laughs> against Bernie Sanders. I just sent you the link. Do you see it in the chat, Shane? Uh, no, but I'll find it um, when uh, we go into a break. So thank you so much for that. Okay, because uh, when I read that back in 2017, I didn't, I, I did, I'm not a lawyer, but I didn't see any legally way, legal way around that. Uh, you know, how can we democrat, democratize with a small d, a private club? I mean, I had a personal experience once with a social club where I tried to do that, and the end result was they simply kicked me out. <laughs> so, you know, I just sent you the link. Just want you to know. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs>